So I'm going to talk today, we're, we're going to talk today about asynchronous hyperparameter optimization on Spark. And I'm going to start out by talking about probably the most controversial essay in AI this year. It was by the father of uh, reinforcement learning. His name is Rich Sutton. And he basically said, do not add human intelligence to your AI applications. It's a waste of time because what will happen is we'll have more compute available to us and we'll be able to use computation to compute features or engineer features automatically. And he basically said the two methods that work really well when we scale with compu available compute are search and learning. Now, you're at the Spark conference, we talk about scaling compute, and you probably think, well, Spark scales with available compute. Spark is the answer. And uh, obviously it's not the complete answer. It is partly the answer, but what it's not the answer for is search. So the problem with Spark for search is that it has a computational model, we call it both synchronous parallel computing, and that doesn't work particularly well with searching. And that's basically what the talk's gonna be about. We're gonna talk about how we solve this problem, how we could add what we call directed search or asynchronous search in Spark, which has not got a, a good architecture for this type of problem. And you may have heard of frameworks like Ray that work with asynchronous tasks, and people are using Ray because they think it's much better. What we can show you now is that we can do this in Spark uh, as well. So I'm gonna put this in context. Uh, what I said, Spark is good for learning, but not great for search. So what we call learning traditionally, in, in, if we take deep learning as an example, that's the inner loop that you can see here. So that's when you're training a model, you know what your hyperparameters are. We can scale out learning uh, using Spark. And we did this, I had a talk last year about this at the Spark Summit Europe. And what we showed is that we can use the collective all uh, architecture and algorithm to scale out deep learning on TensorFlow with Spark. Uh, but what we're gonna talk about today in more, in more detail is the, what we call the outer loop. So that's how do we find good hyperparameters when we're training models. And what that typically needs you, makes you, you really need to do is you need to search for hyperparameters. And you can search by doing random search, undirected search, or you can also do directed search. So, uh, we can break them up. And so we're saying basically Spark is okay for learning, not great for search, how do we do it? And I'm gonna, we're gonna talk about this work in the context of a platform that we've developed. It's an open source platform for data intensive AI. It's called Hopsworks. Little bit of background on what the platform is about. We started out by making HDFS highly scalable. We have a distributed consistent metadata layer there. We added GPUs to Yarn so that we could make Spark work with GPUs on lots of machines at Yarn. And we had a lot of nice technical milestones. There's also Beam and Flink in here. And today we're gonna to talk about how we unify hyperparameter optimization and even ablation studies using this Spark framework. And I think we're the first framework to do that. So what the platform itself is about is, is how do we make the whole end-to-end -end cycle of machine learning and deep learning, how do you make it easier to use? So if you're a data scientist, you probably have seen some variant of this diagram before. It shows you that the little box in the middle training models is really just a small part of building end-to-end -end machine learning applications. And we have something called a feature store to hide the complexity of engineering your features. And then we have a lot of APIs for doing things like distributed uh, training, hyperparameter tuning. We're gonna talk about one of those today, Maggie. Um, but also model serving. If you're interested, there's a talk about the feature store tomorrow. Um, I think it's at 11.50 or 11.30, I'm not sure. So what the platform is, is it's a, it's a data platform for doing machine learning at scale, but it supports Spark and it supports batch computing and streaming. It even supports Flink. And uh, you can do distributed machine learning and we use Spark to do distributed machine learning. And we do them with GPUs and we do serving on the platform. But it, just a little bit of detail, there's some, a bunch of services in there. You're not just restricted to Spark. You can also do Beam, Flink on Beam, uh, or Beam on Flink. And then there's support for things like TensorFlow, Scikit-Learn, um, and uh, PyTorch. So everything we're talking about today relating to hyperparameter optimization, you can do that with Scikit-Learn, TensorFlow, uh, or PyTorch. So I'm gonna hand over to Martz, who's gonna talk in more detail about the, the framework itself. Um, so welcome, yeah. Um, I'm sure you all have heard the uh, quote, AI is the new electricity, but what we have to ask ourselves is, uh, what engine should we actually use to generate this electricity? Uh, because engines matter. We don't wanna charge our new electric vehicles with dirty diesel engines, for example. Uh, we wanna use clean energy, and 
uh, if we take that into our hops works and into uh, our ML pi pipelines, um, what it means is we want to be horizontally scalable at all stages of our machine learning pipeline. Um, we, use, we can use BART for, dat for data ingestion and preparation. On Hopsworks, we have the feature store to store our machine learning features. Um, and then comes a the big part where data scientists uh, have to get involved uh, heavily. And this is usually a bottleneck because um, it's an iterative approach. You have to do hyperparameter optimization. You do abl ablation studies, what's actually the important parts of your deep learning model. And this slows down our, our pipeline. So what we thought is we also want to use Spark uh, for this part of the, uh, of the pipeline to make it more scalable. Um, in reality, the approach looks more like this, iterative. So you set some the data scientist sets some hyperparameters, tunes its model or trains its model, uh, evaluates the performance and repeats. Uh, this is very slow. Um, and it's greedy. It leads to local optima in your hyperparameter search. And search spaces get usually large, especially with deep learning. So it gets even more complicated. Uh, on a more theoretical level, what we're actually trying to solve is a black box optimization problem. Um, we have some search space, which are our hyperparameters, and some feasible intervals, let's say. Um, and we have some meta-level learning or optimization algorithm that we want to use to generate samples from that uh, search space. Um, subsequently, we can learn the model or we, we train the model, which is a complete black box. We don't have any gradient information and it only returns a single metric, which is the final performance of the model. Um, once we have that metric, we can update our knowledge and generate new samples. So if we actually want to scale this horizontally, what we would like ideally to do is we add a queue in between these two parts uh, so that we can generate trials ahead of time. And every time a worker finishes or we scale it to multiple workers, every time a worker finishes, he can take a new trial, report the old metric back to the uh, meta-level learning algorithm, generates a new trial for the queue and continue. But uh, if we want to run this on a real system, there are a few questions that arise like, which algorithm should we actually use for the meta-level learning of this uh, pipeline? How do we monitor progress if everything's running distributed? Uh, we need to collect logs or current metrics. Um, how do we get the results from the different machines in the very end? Um, and what about fault tolerance? What if one of the workers fails? What if our optimization part fails? Uh, we don't want to lose the progress of the whole experiment because usually Hyperparameter tuning can take a few days if you automate it fully, so you don't want to lose that progress. Um, and we said this should be managed with platform support, and uh, that's why we built Maggie. It's a flexible framework for running different black box optimization algorithms with Spark on Hopsworks, and it supports asynchronous successive halving, Bayesian optimization, random search, grid search, and more to come. Um, but let's take a step back uh, if we look at synchronous search, how can we actually, synchronous search we can uh, implement fairly easily in, in the Spark execution model. Um, let's say you have grid search, you grid your parameters, uh, you generate the trials, you start a job with n tasks, one for each trial, uh, you wait until all the tasks finish, you return the results, you find the maximum uh, on the driver and you return the results. Uh, it's fairly straightforward. Um, a bit more advanced approach would be something like uh, uh, generative or uh, yeah, like a population-based approach uh, where you have a population of parameters, you wait until all of them finish training, you do some mutation and crossover and you st start a new population. You can also model that in Spark by using the stages for each generation of the algorithm. Um, but this is actually inefficient um, because we can make use of the information that we have of the trials currently running and compare them to the ones that are finishing uh, to make decisions very early if a trial is actually going to perform well in the end or if we should stop it very early to save on the resources. And uh, that wastes a lot of compute because if we uh, stop a trial early, uh, we can't actually dynamically assign a new task to that executor because we started the job already and you can't uh, dynamically add new tasks to a job once it's already started. 
Um, so you can add early stopping, but you could also use a asynchronous algorithm by nature, for example, by Bayesian optimization. You don't have to wait until all the trials in the stage have finished to update your knowledge, your model, your optimization model. You can always update it once one single one finishes. So you want to make use of this asynchronism to save resources. Um, there are a bunch of more performance enhancement methods. Early stopping, for example, early median stopping rule just compares at similar points of time in training. Is it performing worse than the median of the rest of the trials? I want to kill it right away. Performance curve, curve prediction and their multi-fidelity methods, which basically assign different training times to or different resources to trials, uh, more resources to the more promising trials. Um, for example, here, you in the beginning, you start eight trials with 12% uh, of the resource. Uh, you train them and you only continue with the best half of it uh, and go on until you have only one left. Uh, but you need an asynchronous me mechanism to make full use of your resources. Um, because if you look at it, in this case we have 10 workers, and as soon as you are progressing in your algorithm and you have less than 10 uh, trials in your, in your current stage, um, the efficiency of your cluster drops because you, can, you can't make use of all the machines that you have available. Um, the current state of the art is an asynchronous version of this algorithm. Instead of uh, leaving those workers idle, it basically uh, continues to explore uh, the search space and adds new trials in the bottom rung to the, uh, yeah, to the algorithm. And uh, therefore, it's able to do more exploration, keep all your machines busy in, this, in the same amount of time. Um, so yeah, how can we fit this actually into Spark? Because there's clearly a mismatch between Spark tasks and stages and the conception of trials that we have uh, in, our, in, in hyperparameter optimization. An additional problem could be stragglers. What if your uh, model actually doesn't converge or um, you want to detect that and be able to stop it? Um, yeah, Databricks approach for the, basically for the inner loop that Jim was talking about is Project Hydrogen for distributed deep learning and a new addition to Hyperopt uh, called Spark Trials. And we are doing things a bit differently. Um, we can talk about it after the talk. Uh, the details. Um, so our, how does our solution look like? Basically what we do is we block the executors that are available uh, with very long running tasks. So throughout the experiment runtime, uh, we block each executor with a single task and we allow for communication or we add communication between the tasks and the driver uh, that's possibly running on a different machine. Um, by doing so, we have the possibility to send metrics while the model is training with a heartbeat to the driver collected on a driver, and the driver can make global decisions on early stopping comparing all the metrics uh, and send early stopping signals to the single workers. And if a trial is stopped, the task will just contact the driver, say, here, I need a new trial, and it will get a new trial and continue uh, training a new model. Um, if you dive a bit deeper, this is a bit technical now. Um, on the Spark driver, how does it look like? Um, we set up a little RPC server and a component that we call the optimizer. Um, the RPC server is the one receiving messages from the clients on, in the tasks, passes the messages to the optimizer, and the optimizer will, uh, for example, compute a learning curve prediction and make an early stopping decision, modifies some shared data, and the next time the RPC server gets contacted by the task, it will just look in the shared data, should I stop, send a stop signal or not, and send it back. So it's non-blocking and the, the trials continue training all the time. If you run this on uh, Hopsworks, you get a few additional uh, benefits. We are able to register the server with our Hopsworks REST API, and through that, we can set up another client in, inside our Jupyter Notebook uh, to retrieve the current best model, the current best metrics, and so on. So you get actually user feedback in your Jupyter Notebook, which is very nice uh, to see your experiment progressing. Um, on the other side, the Spark tasks, um, what they do, uh, they just 
when they start, they register with the server, say, uh, get the trial, and from there on, they start training, send periodical heartbeats with the logs and the metrics of the current trial, and receive back a signal whether to stop or with a new trial in case they are uh, idle at the moment. Um, and yeah, like I said before, with the client in Jupyter, we are, pos we are able to get the logs from the server and report statistics and logs inside the Jupyter notebook. Um, we are, so one of the advantages of this setup is that we get the fault tolerance of the executors because they are stateless in a sense that if a task fails, it just gets restarted, it re-registers with the driver and it will get a new trial and continue. So we don't lose the entire uh, progress of the experiment. And if you run it on Hopsworks, we have a distributed file system underlaying, so we can actually also checkpoint the state of the optimizer to, to disk, and uh, in case of failure of the driver, we could pick up the experiment and, uh, and start from there again. Um, how does it look like for a user? Um, we wanted it to be as simple as possible to get started, no definition of external YAML files, everything should be possible in your notebook. Um, so we went for this notebook approach. Uh, the first thing you have to do, you have to initialize the search space. It currently has uh, four different parameter types. You can have integer, double, uh, categorical, discrete, and you provide it with some, uh, with some in feasible interval, basically. Um, in this case, I have a kernel and a pooling layer, and um, then the only thing we want the user to do, because we, we assume basically that he has written his training function already, or his training in Keras or TensorFlow or PyTorch, uh, the only thing we want you to do is pack it into a Python function and provide the hyperparameters as arguments to your function. Um, in order to be able to get the current metric of the training, the only thing you have to include is something called a reporter, and that's part of the, the Maggie API. And if you have your training loop, you just call reporter.broadcast and give it the metric that you want to send back to the driver. That should be the metric that you're optimizing. Um, if you're not writing your own training loops, we have, a Keras, we have Keras callbacks or TensorFlow callbacks to do the same thing for you. Uh, and in the end, you return the final accuracy. And once you have defined this, it's as easy as experiment.lagom. Lagom is a Swedish word, and it means just the right amount, not, enough, not too much, not too little. And um, you basically pass it the training function, the search space, the kind of optimizer you want to use, random search, ASHA, whatever is available, how many trials you want to evaluate. You can give it a name and a direction if you want to min or maximize. Um, there are additional parameters. For example, how, if you use early stopping, how long do you want to wait? How many trials should finish before you actually start comparing running trials to these ones? Because uh, you don't want to do that right from the beginning. Um, yeah. An additional thing we wanted to achieve is that it should be extensible. Like if you have your own algorithm optimizer or early stopping, it should be very easy to implement it yourself. And it's as simple as implementing two abstract Python uh, objects, classes, and um, with the optimizer having three methods, it has an initialized hook that gives you some freedom to set up your model or data structures that you need. Uh, the most important function is a get suggestion. It gets called by the optimizer, it gets uh, the finished trial and um, should return a new trial. So you have to implement the logic of returning a new trial, and if you think the experiment is finished, it should just return none, uh, and that gives the signal to stop the entire experiment. And finally, some hook to, uh, for you to compute the maximum or to get the best, um, the best trial from all your trials. Um, for the early stopping, it's a stateless method, so it gets called in an in a, in a interval, and you get the trials that are currently running with their metrics and the list of final or like yeah the list of final trials and the direction so you can uh, yeah either implement some heuristic or some complex algorithm um, yes 
uh, if we look at some results, we did some experiments on a small scale. Uh, the first one on the left, uh, CUDA ConfNet. Um, basically, what's to see is that this model was most of the hyperparameter combinations performed very well. So it's very hard to decide on early stopping. And as you can see, we have, we have ASHA, uh, which is the asynchronous successive halving. Uh, we have random search with early stopping and random search with no stopping at all. Um, actually, the random search with early stopping and the random search with no stopping, the early stopping has not that much effect. All, almost all of them find similarly good models. Um, that's because the model is not very sensitive to the hyperparameter, so early stopping doesn't make much sense. But if we look at the asynchronous algorithm, um, we all gave them the same amount of resources on the same cluster in terms of training time. Um, the asynchronous state-of-the-art algorithm uh, finds its best model already after half the time. So you have the other half of, of your training time, of your experiment time actually left to train your full model. Uh, so the ASHA algorithm actually not only outputs the best combination, but it also gives you the fully trained model in the same time as the other algorithms. Um, if you now look at an experiment or at a model that's very sensitive to hyperparameters, you will see that uh, early stopping makes a much, more, much bigger difference in terms of finding a good model. Um, the asynchronous algorithm performs way better. Um, also, the early stopping in random search finds better models earlier. And actually, in, in ASHA, for example, we are able to perform many more trials in the same time, so or start trials, basically. They are not finished. Um, and therefore, we have much more exploration in our search space, being able to find better models, better hyperparameter combinations. Um, something that we've added recently um, because it's very similar to hyperparameter optimization in, uh, in its nature, is uh, ablation studies. Um, it's as easy as replacing the optimizer in Maggi um, with an ablator. What is an ablator? Basically, we want to find out which parts of my deep learning model are actually the important parts that lead to good performance. Um, so, for example, we can leave out features so to see which features are important. Um, we can leave out layers. Um, so if you look at features, basically we drop features one after another, leave one out at the moment, at the time, uh, to see how big the influence is on the performance. Um, the same for layers. We, we drop layers in our network uh, and to find the, the actual necess necessary uh, layers. Uh, that's what we call leave one component out uh, uh, ablation. The API is fairly simple as well. Um, instead of a search space, you define an ablation study. Um, you give it your training data set from Hopsworks from the feature store, the, label na the name of the label that you want to predict. Uh, and subsequently, you define which features, for example, to ablate in this class, PC class and FAIR, get dropped each, uh, each at a time. Uh, or you can include layers to be ablated. Um, you have to give them names, and um, I'll show you in a second why. And uh, you can also include groups of layers and in or match prefixes. So if you have a group of, feet of layers that are, start with my dense, then you can ablate all of these at a time. Um, finally, um, you have some base model generator, which is basically the function, a function taking your Keras model and you have to give names to your layers. Um, in Keras, you have a possibility to name your layers, and that's why we need the names, so we can make the connection of ablating them. And this base model generator, uh, in the end, will generate a new model for each of the, uh, of the trial runs. And then the same as with uh, optimization. Um, instead of having your own model definition in here, you just call the model function and include it in your function signature and do the same thing as, as before. So, yes. Um, conclusion is, so we want people to avoid iterative hyperparameter optimization because it's slow, it's greedy, and suboptimal. Um, 
black, but if you want to do black box optimization at scale, it's very hard. Uh, if you run it on a real system, especially if you long, la run long experiments, up to weeks if you want. Um, there are actually state-of-the-art algorithms like ASHA, which are asynchronous, which is very important. And so we need a framework for that to do that for us and optimize, uh, automate it, basically. Um, so we can save the resources and early stop model, sensible models or models that are sensitive to hyperparameters. Um, what's next? Um, we want to add more algorithms and uh, we want to provide some way to compare experiments because it's very hard. Each algorithm has its different uh, definitions. So for example, if you compare random search to ASHA, how much resources do you actually give to each trial in random search? If you give low resources, um, you can perform much more exploration, uh, but your results are not as robust. Uh, so how do you compare these two algorithms? You, we need to find some way to make them more comparable. Um, we are adding implicit provenance. So if you actually run a Maggie experiment, everything gets tracked, all your artifacts uh, get versioned, and you don't have to call extra hooks to, for example, save your model or um, to create the logs. And we want to add support for PyTorch. It is possible um, to use it right now, but for example, there's no callback uh, yet for, to use our report. You would need to write your own training loops. Um, I'll give you a quick demo on how it looks like. So this is Hopsworks. Um, I selected the Jupyter tab, so we just want to open a Jupyter notebook. Um, I already started an uh, instance with um, four executors, basically. So we can do four parallel experiments. Uh, each one of them has a single GPU attached to it that's isolated. Uh, and we provide some memory for the executor, some memory for the, for the driver. Um, I already, this is a notebook, it's a simple fashion MNIST example. Um, I started the Spark context. Um, as you have seen earlier, the first step should be to uh, define your search space. Um, you import the search space object for a class from Maggie. Um, define your search space either all at once or you add one hyperparameter after another. Um, so let's execute this actually. Um, then you make your import of the experiments module of Maggie and the Keras uh, callback for the early stopping. And, and here's the big training function. So I took a simple MNIST model, convolutional uh, net, and put it into a training function. I have my three, um, uh, my three hyperparameters and the additional reporter. So what you have to do is, um, first of all, you add the Keras callback, providing it with the reporter and the uh, metric to be optimized, accuracy or loss if you want. Uh, you can also provide the TensorBoard callback to log to HDFS. Um, and then your fit function, you include the callbacks, that's important. And uh, in the very end, you evaluate. You can do prints, and this is the cool thing, these prints will show up in your notebook. So if you are debugging, for example, uh, you don't have to go into the Spark UI to look, search in the Spark executor logs uh, for your errors or w what's going on. Um, we can actually print it inside the Jupyter Notebook because we have this communication between the driver and the executors. Uh, and finally, you return the same metric uh, that you want to optimize. So let's execute this. Um, and the final step, is a experiment.lagom training function. Um, we want to do random search at this moment, and the, by default, it's using the median stopping rule. We maximize 20 trials. We give it a name, an interval of how often we want to check for early stopping. Um, I'm just training 10 epochs each, so it has to be f every three seconds we're checking to stop a model, and the number of trials to be finished first before we start comparing them. Um, so let's run this. It takes a second to spin up the executors. As you can see, we have currently uh, 
there are no executors because they are dynamically executed. And now the executor is picked up and we should see progress in a few seconds. Um, yeah, so now all the GPUs, we have four GPUs available, are taken by this job. Um, it's running. And in a few seconds, the, the first logs, so I, I'm printing the final accuracy of each model. So um, as soon as the first model finishes, um, they will show up here. At the, in the meantime, you can check out, because of provenance, uh, you can go to experiments and you will be able to see your experiment is running here at the moment. Um, it's maximizing a metric and once it's finished, you will get a comparison of all the hyperparameter combinations with their final metrics. Um, and you can actually not only return in your model training function, not only return the metric, you could return anything. If you do plots in there, you can return the plots and they all uh, get associated with that experiment so you can find them later on. Um, so if we go back, yeah, so now the experiment started. Um, eight trials have finished already. You see the prints. This is a feature that needs to be used with care. If, of course, if you do too many prints in your training function, it will blow up your Jupyter notebook, but for, it's for debugging purposes. And uh, so, and it should, if there are bad trials in there, it should start early stopping trials at some point, yeah. And last but not least, if you have an, a finalized experiment, you can start TensorBoard and start looking, looking into it. And for TensorBoard to work, you just need to add your TensorBoard callback, uh, providing the providing the TensorBoard log dir, which we, we will create for you everything, and it's tracked. So you just do from Maggie import TensorBoard, uh, tensorboard.logdir, and off you go. Um, when TensorBoard loaded the data. Yeah, so here you have all the trials. Each trial gets an ID, and you can go to the uh, HPerms tab. Here it is. Um, you see all your trials. There's actually one trial that's been early fin early stopped, so you can't see any metrics for that one. And you can open it, open them and look at each of them and individually and find your best trial and also do some investigation on uh, which parameters performed well and which didn't. So that's it. Um, like to thank you. I'll be. We have time for questions. Um, some acknowledgements and reference. There are, there's a team working on this, and I would like to thank all of them. And yeah, I'm open for questions. Thank you. Thank you. Very good presentation. Uh, out of the various optimizers that you have used, uh, which one has performed the best? That's question number one. And related question is, uh, when you talk about hyperparameter optimization, are you uh, also including the uh, just the features or also the architecture of the of the model? Uh, you know, such as in a decision tree, for example. You know, yeah. because you thinking of black box, in the decision tree, you can actually have the bucket size, the leaf, the depth of the tree, and all of those things as well within the, within the parameter optimization. Okay. Um, so first question, the best optimizer in terms of, there's always a trade-off between uh, resources used and the results you get, but uh, the ASHA or the asynchronous success of halving is pretty much a state of the art at the moment. and. Uh, yields the best results uh, that we've seen. Um, if you look into neural architecture search, for example, and because you can model neural arch architecture search also as a hyperparameter optimization problem, um, there are other algorithms like reinforcement learning or uh, population-based approaches that perform also very well. So you always have to look a bit at the domain as well, uh, which optimizer performs best. I, I can take the second question briefly. So the, we, we, we mentioned ablation studies and hyperparameter optimization. Where is the difference, right? The difference, as I see it, is 
when you have to change the code in the inner loop, you actually literally have to write different code. I'm going to have dropout. I'm not going to have dropout. I'm going to add this layer. I'm not going to add this layer. I'm going to add batch normalization or not add it. So typically, data scientists don't do that. They don't write 20 different programs. So what our ablation API is about is making sure that the inner loop stays the same. You never have to change the code. What we do is we externalize the creation of things like the layers of the input data that we can change them outside that inner loop. So the inner code never changes. It's unobtrusive. But we can still change the structure uh, of your, of your uh, tra inner training loop. So the architecture, the model architecture, whatever regularization techniques you're using, whatever features you're putting in. So that's where I kind of draw the difference. So traditionally, everyone does high parameter optimization because it's easy. They're, they're, these are variables you change outside. We parallelize enough, we go. But ablation is a bit harder. You have to do, have a programming framework around it. <clears throat> Very nice talk, thank you. Uh, so not everyone does uh, deep learning. <laughs> uh, so say that I have a machine learning pipeline that uses Spark, uh, but uh, due to the limitations of libraries around, we use uh, Hyperopt. Should we try Maggie instead of Hyperopt? Well, it's open if source. Want, yeah, <laughs> if you want early stopping, then What yes, are the pitfalls should. if we try? What, what are the things that we need to be careful about? Um, so, what you need to be careful about is the definition of your, like, like I said, it's always a trade-off between stopping early models or having them run longer to get more robust results, and I think that's the hardest part about it to, like, find this trade-off. Uh, I, I think the best I can say, we, a year ago I talked about this uh, at the Spark Summit, and we've been do doing this in production with a lot of companies who've been using... Uh, the hyperparameter optimization with tasks in Spark. And we saw um, when we were training GANs, which are very hyper sensitive to hyperparameters, that they would sit there and bang on the desk and say, I have to wait too long. So we saw a need early, and we, we went for it then early to, to, to build this thing. So um, regards to your question, hyperopt, there is, uh, Databricks have led an initiative to, use the, to maintain the hyperopt API, but to do this task-based approach. Um, we, what we're basically saying here is, well, if you really want to do the state of the art, you need to do asynchronous trials. And that's what we're doing here with Spark. Very short question, because uh, thanks a lot for the talk. Um, I was just wondering how, how we could try is it just, if I want to try what you've just described for my own pipelines, machine learning yep. or deep learning, um, <clears throat> do I just have to integrate Maggie and make it work on my own cluster, depending, or is it uh, the, the specific communication you added between the, the workers and the drivers within Spark? Is it within Spark already or within Maggie? Or, uh, no. Or do I have to, or am I forced to use uh, Upwork's platform? Um, no, so we wanted to make it as simple as pip install Maggie. And uh, so the communication, the RPC is inside Maggie. Uh, it's not to Spark related. Um, the only thing, you need to have it on all your machines available. Or like, yeah, you need to allow for the communication. and. You get additional benefits by running it on Hopsworks. For example, because we have the HDFS underlying, you get driver fault security uh, and edit, like logging, for example, what I showed, or TensorBoard. Um, but yeah, it should be as easy as uh, running it on any Spark cluster if you have it. Uh, we have a minimal version that, uh, that works on any Spark cluster, and yeah, we'll try to maintain it. One more question. Um, no. Yep. We, I think we have time for one more, and that'll be the last one, because people will need time to get to their next sessions. Uh, what is stopping rule for, uh, for trial? Uh, in optimization, next iteration is usually better than previous. How you decide this trial is not perspective? How, how you stop the trial? In basis one, heuristic, one heuristic is median stopping rule. Or, or you predict the final performance of the model. Based on, all the the final of, based on all the learning curves of, curves of the models that have finished already. 
and then you say, oh, this is going to perform worse than most of the trials that I finished already, so why I will, of course, you, you, you will make some mistakes. You estimate the final results from current situation. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I would like to thank, thank the speakers one more time. One final round of applause.